I just arrived to, um, to Amsterdam, as you call, um, and now waiting for my flight to, uh, to Dubai. So I'm um, looking forward to, to meet everyone at the same time as possible. I tried really to plan everything, but one thing I didn't plan when I came here to Dublin uh, is the connection. So in France, we are connected like that, but in Dublin, it's connected like, like that. So it's a bit different than, um, okay, I need to find a, a, um, an adaptator or something like that. Hello everyone, so I'm here at the Topra Symposium uh, 2019 and uh, I will try to make a documentary for, for you, so just to explain you all the events that are happening, uh, to explain you also uh, about the conferences. I'll try also to pull up some of the speakers uh, so that we can also have their opinion and maybe a summary of the, what they were talking about. I'd just like to welcome all our colleagues from the medical device world to their symposium, which I'd like to officially open now. So welcome, have a fantastic session. So welcome, today we are at the Clayton Burlington in uh, Dublin uh, for the Topra Symposium 2019. Um, we are at day two of this, uh, of this event um, and I'm here with Janine Jemison. And uh, it's a great honour for me to be doing the first session of the Medical Devices Symposium. And I'm going to spend a few minutes just talking through a few things, to put things into context, and then I'll introduce the speakers. And just to let you know that we've got some Mentimeter questions. So for those of you who haven't yet participated in Mentimeter, the, the symposium, and if you get your phones out uh, and get ready to put in Mentimeter onto your safari, so the, the session was on drug delivery devices and new regulatory processes from May 2020 because the new MDR has a huge impact on the pharma industry as well as the medical device industry. So this is something that's not very well known um, or not very well recognised when the first discussions started about the MDR, but it does have a really big impact. So there's been an increasing amount of effort looking into this. And Topra Wraps did a workshop last year to bring all together lots of different stakeholders to discuss it because that's the thing, there's a lot of different stakeholders involved here from the Commission, the European Medicines Agency, the notified bodies and industry obviously. So we had a workshop last November and this was a follow-up session to talk about progress, what's happened. So the people that I had in my session were Ivana Hayes from EMA, so she's a medical device expert who's been seconded from HCRA to EMA to help them implement the new responsibilities with the MDR. And then Nick Lee from the HBRA, he's a pharmaceutical assessor who's co wrap for the new EMA Quality Working Party, Biological Working Party collaborative guidance on what information companies need to provide about their devices from next May. And then we had um, Colma Rourke from NSAI, Notified Body, to give the Notified Body perspective and explain to the audience, which was mostly pharma, about the impact of the MDR, but mostly about how Notified Bodies work, the way they work so differently to the people in the pharmaceutical world. And then finally, we had Paul Scannell from Mylan and also chair of the Medical Device Workforce at Medicines for Europe, the generics organisation. 
So that was the panel of speakers. They all had 15 minutes to give their different perspectives about what's happened. And it was fascinating to see the different views, the amount of work that has gone into this. Considering that there's been no additional resources put into the system for this, and there's been a huge learning curve for everybody involved about the, the ways that the two different regulatory systems work, medical devices on one side, yeah. pharmaceuticals on the other. Exactly. That's one of the big things, and, and it's not unique to Europe. And, and our session, the, the theme of this conference is Europe at the forefront of uh, regulation. And there was a comment made about the impact of the MDR and the fact that notified bodies are under such pressure with resources, yeah. um, getting themselves ready for redesignation, their numbers are going down, and they don't have any fixed timelines for review. So this I mean, is I'm, all... I think, I think it's also the fact that, uh, first, I think they are, more, uh, most importantly, they want to take care about devices, pure devices, yeah. because it's their first market. And then the, the issue can be, there is pharmaceutical companies that will come to them to just ask them for a review of uh, the small device that they are using for their for their drug, and for them maybe it would not be a priority because uh, yeah. it's something that it's it can be maybe a bit too much too much for them. Yeah. So at the end, this was I think this was one of the questions during the, your session yeah. about the, the the concern regarding this timeline with notified body. Yeah, absolutely. So so there's a concern about who they can go to, and, and the advice was to go to as many notified bodies as you can yeah. contact to sure. see who's got the capacity to do this, who's got the interest to do it. So that was one of the, the points that came out. But also, like you say, about timelines, because it was the point was made very clearly that the pharma industry works very strictly to guideline, to timelines. Welcome to the Topra Symposium 2019. Welcome, we are here at the Topra Symposium 2019 in uh, Dublin, October 1st. Uh, and uh, I'm here with Lorna Griffin, CEO of uh, Rapport Global Strategic Services. Uh, so I am uh, working with uh, Lorna, with her company, uh, as I am a medical device advisor uh, for Rapport uh, Global Strategic Services uh, related to medical devices specifically. So um, I wanted to have Lorna with me just to help us to understand what is exactly the, the trends for drug devices. So, the question to you is mainly, how do you see the future regarding drug and device? What is, for example, something that will pop up maybe or will happen in five, ten years from now? Um, because from what I understand is that drug before was really working by itself without the need of devices. And now more and more uh, manufacturers are including drug and devices together, which makes it a bit difficult also regarding the regulatory aspect because we have to have mm -hmm. uh, understanding of both. So what do yeah. you see for future on that? Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Munir, for asking that question, because actually it is a hugely changing environment. And up until now, we've been in the situation where medical devices could really be handed in a separate bucket of okay. information with a, like little overlap, as you've mentioned. Um, you know, with with some exceptions, of course. But in the future, as medical device regulation grows, the requirements are moving more towards uh, what we what we see with um, on the pharmaceutical drug products, and particularly, you know, the drive towards risk risk assessment, yeah. which is how we manage everything in both areas, actually. So um, more and more, we need to take into account what the products associated with the drug products will be. We're already seeing that particularly as the whole growth area of personalised medicines yep. with the introduction of um, well, many products requiring biomarkers, particularly in the um, um, oncology area. Yep. And so that's really why we felt it was in essential to the excess success of any regulatory organisation that we have um, an expert in medical devices on board able to advise us because um, we do a lot of work in oncology. Um, we know that many of the new drugs which are targeting pers personalised pathways, etc., will require bi biomarkers in the future. So, we, so talk, we, we talk specifically about, um, uh, we call that, how we call those, uh, mar those uh, companion, device, diagnostic. companion diagnostic? Companion exactly. diagnostic, yes. So, we talk yeah. specifically about that. And if I remember, we had, uh, we had also the episode with uh, Maurizio Tsupo talking about uh, in vitro diagnostic. And yeah. he was mentioning that, he was mentioning that uh, there is a need related to, I mean, there is this 
this new field related to companion diagnostic, uh, which is in vitro diagnostic. And now with the new in vitro diagnostic, there will be some uh, kind of um, high expectation for that. So. As you mentioned, so the need of medical device knowledge will be really growing also in the pharma industry. A hundred percent. And also, as we in that particular area, as we're moving more to scientific advice, particularly for companion diagnostics, okay. we'll also have to involve our medical device colleagues in, in that. I mean, there are many other areas where there's um, going to be more synergy in the future between medical devices and drugs. Um, you know, there's more and more ATMPs coming on the markets yeah. with ma matrix scaffolds, these type of products, um, which we constantly have to think, is there a medical device impact? And uh, uh, you talked about scientific advice. What is a scientific advice? Um, scientific advice is when you um, put together your development plans, prepare um, what you think might be the appropriate way to develop um, a drug product in mm -hmm. this case, and then you go to the regulatory agencies, and it's scientific advice is the European term, um, and then you discuss your plans with them, ask them specific questions about your overall plan, the design of the studies, etc. And in the case of companion diagnostics, the specifics of what um, what data would be required, what you're hoping to bring forward. And also, in the case of companion diagnostics, the impacts on the labelling, which is important to consider because, um, you know, if you, if you need, if you only want to give your drug to a patient who has been diagnosed with X, then you need to have that diagnostic available and freely available and easy to use. Um, where your drug product is going to be used. So there's lots of strategic implications in that particular area. And um, as you mentioned, so um, I mean, the, the cancer or the oncology area um, is discovering new cancer or new things every maybe years. So do we need a, a, the development of companion diagnostic will also grow with this, um, this, this, these discoveries or? I, th I think it will. And I think um, what's particularly a growth area that we've seen is the specific pathways um, in various types of um, uh, cancer so that um, you know the, the new drug products are targeting very specific pathways. Um, okay, uh, so um, then when you say that uh, you need um, somebody to help you in terms of medical devices, so do you have now do you start to have a lot of customers that are coming to you and say, okay, I need your help for drug, but do you have also some skills on devices? No, actually. Um, they're talking to us mainly about their drug products, certainly in the oncology field. And then we're raising the issue okay. of the, the, the diagnostic that they're planning to use in their clinical program. And it's us that's raising that to them and saying, OK, we, you know, we need to identify how we would get that registered, what impact that would have on your labelling, etc. OK, um, so it's really interesting because it means that uh, pharmaceuticals still did notice that there will be a big increase of medical devices or requirements for medical devices. With the new medical device regulation, we have also the, the, the Article 117 that is amending the directive of uh, mm -hmm. medicinal products. So. I suppose they are not really all aware of that and they discover that as soon as they are starting their projects. Yes, I think the, I think the large companies know that. Okay. I think it's the more smaller companies that are um, not necessarily so aware of the impact on, on uh, medical devices. Okay. So uh, that's, that's certainly what we're noticing. Okay, good. So I think, yeah, for pharmaceutical companies, they have really to understand that medical device will be really impacting them in the future. Uh, as Lorna said, mainly companion diagnostic will be also a trend. Uh, so yeah, we have really to look at that. So Lorna, thank you for that. You're welcome. <laughs>
yeah, um, Kim just talked to me about what she's doing and I think it was really an interesting topic for, for you. It has nothing to do with the, specifically the MDR regulation or IVDR, but it's more about archiving of data, finding the data that you have at your company, which can be really a challenge for some uh, medical device manufacturers when, for example, they are registering their products in many countries and then to find exactly what they have registered well. So, Kim, welcome to uh, this, uh, this uh, interview uh, at the Topra Symposium. So, uh, can you tell us more about you and also what your company is doing and then also what exactly is the challenge for medical devices? What exactly your company is doing to help them? Well, um, I'm the new Director of Regulatory Intelligence for INSTEM. INSTEM has many platforms that, to assist uh, medical device companies and pharmaceutical companies with their data management and registration management. What we've been finding is, and what we're trying to provide a solution for, is that single place of truth for your documentation to assure that your registrations are managed properly, that it's easy to manage your registrations, that you know exactly which product is registered where, okay. and to assure that you know, for example, when your renewals are due, because if you miss a renewal, for example, then you might have to take your product off the market. Yeah. And that's a loss of revenue, yeah. a, a loss of face with the health regulators, etc. And that's not something that we want to do. Yeah, it's, 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 I, I, when you told me that, I remember my time in the, in the pharma industry. It was not medical events, but pharma industry, where we were registering products all over the world. And at one point, uh, we had also to track uh, when was the registration done, when is it expiring, when we should also um, renew the registration and it's not done at the expiration that is done before. Exactly, so. exactly and our product will help you to manage that. It will send you a notification well before your renewal is, is, is to be prepared. So this way you have tasks that is sending notification to the product managers to understand exactly what that process is. We'll have special templates. For example, if a renewal in Saudi Arabia yeah. is different than a renewal in Taiwan, which is different than a renewal in Brazil. So this way you can manage that and know exactly which document is where, which version was sent to the different authorities. So this way you can manage all that health authority discussions, etc. So this way your regulatory associates will spend less time on finding data they can get on with their day jobs. But um, as you mentioned, so you have some template for each countries, but um, can we say also that um, uh, if a country change their regulation, um, you also can manage that? We can manage that, yes. So this way we can keep up to date with that regulatory intelligence to assure that your, your registrations will be managed according to the current guidances at that time. Okay, good. So I think it's really something that is really helping. We have also um, some regulation where we say we need to archive the documents for a certain period of years. Is it also something that you are managing? So you put kind of a, a timing on it? Say you can put can a timing on, on that data. However, um, we do have a small EDMS system because okay. um, most, most larger companies have, they already have a management so we link our, ourselves to that EDMS system. Um, so this way you'll have a notification, for example, that you can have those, that data archived for as long as you need to have it archived okay. for. Okay. And um, if we say now that, um, I suppose you have a lot of customers using your, your, your mm -hmm. software, what is one mistake or one thing that they may be that you are noticing or some trends are noticing with those some of the customers when they come to you maybe the first time i i don't i don't know if they are coming like a fresh new customers with the market or they were already had experience with registration and then they come because you are giving them a real solution for them because they have really a problem if i can say we we both ways that we've got pharmaceutical comp customers that are coming to us now for their combination products okay and we've got customers that are coming to us because now that they've got a division that has medical devices um, they come to us because we've got a bespoke medical device platform that's written for medical device registrations okay. it's not it's not um, pharmaceutical under a different hat so the terminology is there for medical devices. We use things like 510K, Global okay. Dossier, 
um, etc. So this way, when because regulatory affairs for medical devices is very different than regulatory affairs for pharma. Yeah, true. So so we we cater to that specific um, that specific group of regulatory professionals. Okay, and uh, so your customers, are, I suppose, are worldwide. It's not really global customers. We've got offices all over the world. We got offices in the States, in Japan, in China, and in India, and all across the UK, in France, etc. Okay. So, so we have somebody in every time zone. <laughs> Good. So, um, yeah, for people if they want really to go and see what Instem is doing, uh, so or contact directly Kim. Yeah, so uh, just contact me yeah. on www.instem.com. Um, and you could see our Samarin RMS regulatory information system. Good, so great for that. So thank you, Kim, for thank for your you, time. thank you. Day. We're from SDL. At SDL, we're focused on the uh, creation, translation, and publishing uh, delivery of multilingual content for medical device companies. So everything from uh, translation into 180 language pairs, um, creation and delivery of content through our content management systems, and use of artificial intelligence in the neural machine translation world, in which we're a pioneer. Uh, SDL is helping medical device companies and associated consultancies and other companies at every stage of the medical device journey. Okay, I'm here with Basile Accra from Chief Sud, and uh, I would just wanted to ask a few questions to Basile regarding the, the MDR and also how to um, to be a, a Chief Auditor. So, yeah, so Basile, uh, I see that you are really connected and linked in and everything. So it's what, how I tried really to connect with you and to see uh, how we can meet each other. And um, yeah, as we have now the situation with the notified bodies that are trying to be accredited, so there is more and more coming to be accredited. I suppose they will also need a lot of resources, some auditors to come to help them and to go and to um, um, to certify the companies. And uh, the first question is mainly um, how to be uh, an auditor within TubeSuit. For example, let's take the, the process with TubeSuit. So that maybe the audience, if they are really interested to be an auditor, they know exactly the process that they should, uh, they should follow. Good morning, Monier, and uh, thank you for inviting me to speak about uh, the new medical device regulation and the need for um, additional resources to address the market needs and to address uh, uh, the need for more resources uh, that are able to conduct uh, assessment of um, manufacturer quality management system as well as technical documentation. So in general, every uh, notified body uh, to be able to be designated and notified for the new regulation, uh, they need to have a sufficient level of expertise. Mm -hmm. And it is described in the medical device regulation that uh, notified bodies are required to hire people with background in the medical field, which is at least four years of professional experience. Okay. And two of those th th uh, four years uh, uh, shall be in the medical device sector. So either in the manufacturing and the design or in the usage of the medical device enabling them to be applying, first of all, to work for a notified body. So it means that a student that is just coming out of school cannot be an auditor for now. This is, uh, this is a problem. Uh, we are uh, talking about uh, experts with okay. professional experience, so they need at least four years of professional experience. And even if you have uh, those amount of years of experience, you will not just be hired by a notified body and get directly uh, authorized to be able to act uh, in a special field. Okay. You need the training at a notified body to be qualified on regulatory knowledge, quality knowledge, be trained to be an auditor, be trained in a special sector where okay. you're going to act because you cannot act as an auditor in general. Quality management is one topic. You have also the technology auditors, which need specialization, enabling them to, to conduct audit in a professional way 
and uh, in a compliant way to the medical device regulation, which means uh, training and authorization of the people takes as a notified body at least one year to 18 months to be able authorized to get uh, uh, out to the market and okay. to start conducting audits. So 18 months, it means 18 months studying or 18 months also going to uh, maybe ac to accompany some auditors and to go with them? It's a combination of both. So uh, the training at notified bodies is a theoretical training as well as practical training. So the theoretical part is a kind of lessons about regulatory requirement, uh, uh, learning also how, how to be uh, an auditor, how to be a te technology auditor, how to be a technical documentation assessor, where to focus, how to do with a risk-based assessment. Um, and it includes also communication training because you need to be uh, trained on how to communicate uh, during audits. And on top of this, you need to conduct a trainee audits. Uh, this means you need to add uh, experience in doing audits. And at the end, you have to be monitored by a person who was who is able to conduct audit to see if you learned out of this process how to do uh, audit in a professional way. Okay, so um, when you, I mean, um, there is auditors that are trained by Tuv, and is there also some consultants that you are hiring to do audits for you? Um, every single notified body uh, has his own uh, system how they deal with uh, working with external or internal auditors. We as an organization, we mainly uh, focus on 100% internal resources. Doesn't mean that we don't have external auditors currently under the current directive. Uh, with the MDR, since we are designated and notified, actually our main focus is our uh, internal resources. Uh, TUFSUD is the biggest notified body in Europe with a huge amount of internal resources. We were in the last uh, three, four years hiring every year 20% additional resources okay. to address the market need. But now you are getting to, to a point where the number of resources available is getting limited because all of us are fishing from the same pool of experts. Yeah, great. Um, so um, as you are growing in terms of resources, so it means also that you can accept more and more manufacturers to, so you can help more and more manufacturers uh, certify them and you are still accepting some manufacturers to uh, to be uh, registered with you uh, actually as 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 an organization uh, we uh, we do all we can to support the healthcare system uh, to keep uh, the system running and to take as much as we can as application. We can't guarantee certification, we can't guarantee an assessment, but you can't take an application if uh, you have limited resources. Okay. So we take applications as long as our capacity is available because it's important for us to be predictable and to have a clear commitment if we take a manufacturer that we don't take them uh, and we can't deliver a service, which is w one of our duty as a notified body to conduct an independent assessment in a period of time. Okay. Um, actually, we have um, five notified bodies that were accredited. Um, uh, there is some notified bodies that are, I mean, on the notified body, what we have also to be careful mm -hmm. is the fact that they are, as you mentioned, specialized on some areas. So there is a list of uh, products that they can uh, certify and uh, some notified bodies can maybe not, not certify all the products. So um, is there, um, for chief suit, so um, is there some products that you cannot do at all or you can really do everything? Uh, we we applied actually for a full, full scope we exclude always uh, one one scope that we don't do and this those are the single use uh, reusable uh, devices okay. so reusability of single use device uh, we do not apply for uh, such a scope but if you look to our designation scope uh, it covers all kind of devices and we have uh, all expertise internally this is why we have been designated and notified for this full scope okay um, related to now the MDR, I think you have now a lot of experience, also a lot of people coming to you and telling you maybe their stories or what they are doing. So what is the common mistake or things that companies are doing or maybe some advice for them, what they should do, uh, if I can say, to be on the right way and to not lose some time? I think the biggest uh, uh, burden for manufacturers at this moment of time is to understand that uh, uh, this is a completely new uh, certification okay. according to a completely new regulation. Yeah. Uh, it is not uh, a move from an old system to a new system by taking into consideration uh, legacy devices and so on. This regulation is uh, a new start, which means uh, you have no special rule for legacy devices. Yeah. 
And based on that, every single device will be certified like it has never been on the market according to new special rules. And this is very important for manufacturers to understand it, uh, to prepare the documentation according to the new requirement, to prepare the quality management system, and to stop waiting for guidance because guidance uh, are promised by the European Commission, but we got that promise since many years yeah. and uh, we are getting some guidance already. But uh, if you spend some time and read the guidance, they are not really answering the question. Uh, some of them, they are adding a burden to the requirement and raising new questions. So preferably medical device manufacturers should uh, use their scientific knowledge, yeah. their regulatory knowledge and start implementing the regulation instead of waiting for the hope of getting good guidance for the future. I mean, uh, I think, yeah, it's a good point. It's the fact that uh, some manufacturers are um, afraid maybe also of notified bodies coming to them and say, no, it's wrong or right. But at one point we have as soon as we have some evidence, as soon as we have really some common sense, as soon as it's logic, I think it can be accepted by a notified body. Uh, the only thing is, uh, yeah, uh, there, as it's new, I think that some manufacturers are really afraid of making the move because they are waiting for some information and some, 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 some guidance. And this is something, as you mentioned, that we are still waiting out of them. Uh, today we had the session where they said that, our, if I remember, 23 um, guidance were released and still 60 are remaining. So it's a, a lot of guidance that are remaining. So if at one point the manufacturers are starting and doing, um, I mean, trying to work on their device, is there a chance or is there a possibility for you to tell them that they are on the right way, like a pre-assessment or pre-submission or pre-work um, pre with you to say, yes, you are on the right path or no, you have to move on this path? Um, so. First of all, I think those are a lot of questions. Um, um, the notified bodies um, are not allowed to do a consultancy. Yeah. So what is important is that a manufacturer prepares his system accordingly and apply to the notified body. Uh, the notified body will use the common sense uh, as a current knowledge, uh, but we need to fulfill the requirement. So a very clear answer, uh, a manufacturer without data, with a promise to collect data, will not get uh, a successful uh, conformity assessment process because notified body will come to a decision that the requirement are not fulfilled. Okay. Uh, notified body is going to balance uh, benefit risk. Uh, they're going to look also on uh, whether this device is in compliance with the current requirement and is reflecting the current state of the art expectations. If this is not the case, uh, they need to take decisions based on the law, which is telling them they have to come to a decision which could be negative. The law is also allowing a so-called conditional uh, uh, approval, so an approval based on conditions. Mm -hmm. So this is where we need to see uh, what is the risk associated with this open question and to come to a conclusion as a notified body. So I think uh, everyone is acting in the interest of the healthcare system. And what is important, like you said, is that they start and not being afraid about a failure because all of us, we are learning at the beginning. Exactly. Uh, we are still missing a lot of guidance. And we saw already with the first corrigendum that our first understanding and interpretation of the regulation, even for the member state, was incorrect because suddenly the European Commission said to us, uh, this sentence has to be uh, 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 understood in a different way uh, than what we, we understood at the beginning. So you see it's a moving target. And we need to act in this moving target at the beginning. And we're going to see a lot of failure at the beginning, which is going to be adopted over the years. Today, after uh, 93, 90 and 93, we had the directives coming in. Okay. And till today, we are still discussing uh, the interpretation of the directives. So we can't expect from a medical device regulation to be published. And immediately, within two years, we know everything. If this is the case, we don't need a job. And I think this is the job security part which is given with the medical device regulation so you can be assured for the next 25 years we will still have interpretation of this new regulation. No, it's uh, it's really a, f a fair point. It's a, a learning curve for both yeah. sides, also three sides if we talk also about competent authorities uh, because they will have to adjust if I can say at certain point. Yeah. Good. Thank you, Basil. So really ha helpful uh, information and I hope yeah this is really uh, in uh, good information for the audience. Thank you. Thank you. All the best. <laughs> Thank you.
Hello, Munir Azouzi here from easymedicaldevice.com and I'm here with uh, Robert van Boxtel uh, from MD Project and he just had a session today about clinical data um, and I wanted to have a small summary of this section with him uh, so that he can explain to us what are clinical data for also small manufacturers because this is something that is really a struggle and uh, also some benefits, uh, how we can um, uh, do the clinical benefit for them and uh, that can be also a big um, issue regarding the medical devices that are really a low class uh, or without a really uh, any clinical data available. So Robert, yeah? please, uh, can you help us to understand all this topic? Well, first of all, thank you Monir for having me. You're welcome. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, we just had a session uh, in, the, in the room downstairs yep. uh, with uh, quite an interesting full room. Exactly. Uh, and we talked about uh, what data are you going to need or what can you use to get a clinical evaluation in place for your devices uh, when you don't even have clinical study data. And uh, if you look into the details of the uh, medical device regulation, there's many options to uh, argue uh, clinical safety performance uh, as now, but you need to have clinical the evidence. Uh, so we discussed about how to get that uh, because not all devices, um, and there will be even clinical data available. Uh, some of the devices are not even used in a clinical setting. Is performance data, technical data from standards, is that sufficient to argue? Um, so we have a lot of customers that are struggling with this. Uh, how, how can I build a clinical evaluation if I don't have clinical data? Yeah, true. <laughs> Uh, and uh, the, the, we discussed the, the possibility of uh, you know, finding other type of data and uh, maybe uh, I introduced a new concept, the benefit level, yeah. and maybe the benefit level can help us to argue, look for a, a device that is, is, is common, uh, there's uh, for a patient low benefit like, uh, like, a, like a plaster. There's a benefit, obviously, mm -hmm. but uh, the, the, the benefit is slightly different from a pacemaker, let's put it that way. Yeah. Um, and depending on these type of levels, and maybe we can predefine the type of acceptable data as a starting point uh, for your clinical evaluation. And for low risk, that would mean uh, you are going to use, you, uh, from your risk management point of view, uh, you know, what data can I gather? There's a lot of technical standards, uh, f uh, horizontal, uh, yeah. but definitely product standards, vertical product standards, and they can be used. So we have, uh, usually it's, it's, we are evaluating the benefit risk. Oh, here. that's, yeah, that's, now, that's the next step. Now like yeah. we are uh, more looking at the benefits because the risk are really low, because now we have a class one mm -hmm. maybe, so risk mm -hmm. is really low, mm -hmm. and we are saying what are the benefits, so we, for, as we mentioned, the levels for yeah, benefits. Yeah, 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 so for example, if, for the example of the plaster, uh, uh, there is definitely a benefit, yeah. uh, but it's different type of benefit than uh, when you compare it to a pacemaker or, or, or when you compare it to uh, anything else. But still, you, the manufacturers need to find some sort of uh, argumentation. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the benefit? And how, uh, another concept is how many patients should, should, ben yeah. should, should benefit? Is there a percentage? And who's going to, to determine that? Mm -hmm. So a lot of questions still on this. And it's a concept that uh, needs to be worked out further. And that's what we have discussed. And we had some... Uh, after the session, we had some discussions also in the room uh, with, with the participants, and uh, I think there is definitely a, a common ground to, you know, further uh, work on this. And uh, this is the first time we, you know, we uh, uh, put it out there. Uh, responses are okay, and probably there will be people saying, ah, it's not going to fly." But we, we think it's it's definitely benefit beneficial for manufacturers also that they know how to argue benefit versus. Risks. Risks, we all know. It's, it's a standard for it. There is a uh, usability assessment. There is, it's all focusing on the risk, but it's, n some, it's also focusing on performance, but not on the benefit. And the benefits is, if we can maybe quantify something like that, it will help um, the all types of manufacturers uh, on their clinical evaluation. Yeah, what, um, I, what I liked on your presentation first is that you mentioned some of the medical devices that are that we, we have no benefit, like you mentioned the plaster, we mentioned yeah. some sterilizers. Well, so. no, the plaster has a benefit. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm using them. Yeah, it's not, it's not a question yeah. of benefit, it's a question yeah. of uh, they are really low risk and we yeah. have no data or yeah, not a lot of data. Yeah. So, uh, but sterilizer. also sterilizers in hospital. Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, what is the clinical benefit? Well, there's an indirect clinical benefit. Do you need to argue as a, a sterilizer company, indirect clinical benefit? Yeah. That would be rather 
strange, exactly. I think. <laughs> uh, can we not use the technical performance? Because there are some standards for these type of sterilizers. It needs to meet certain performance requirements. That should be enough. Yeah. I think. I think. Also. And also in combination, of course, with usability data, are people able to use it in a proper way, etc., etc. And that's all coming from risk management. So you can you have a very nice link towards risk management, uh, and you can discuss uh, you know performance data, and you can discuss the benefit. The benefit is obvious, but you still need to you know in a clinical you need to write something down on it. Exactly. What? Common sense, but. <laughs> But uh, on the session, there was also Basila Kroa from Tuf Sud, mm -hmm. and uh, I mean, what you were saying on the presentation was, was really making sense and had really mm -hmm. a lot of value, if I can say, for some manufacturers that yeah. are trying to yeah. prove that their data are correct or that uh, yeah. their product is really has a lot of benefit. So, um, do you think that any notified body will accept that, and there is no kind of uh, uh, yeah? Pushback? Well, th that's a nice thing, and that's also what uh, Dr. Akra referred to. Uh, you get a guarantee until you walk out of the door because. Tomorrow the world has changed. Exactly. Uh, every day there's new guidance documents. I just heard there's going to be 60 more guidance documents yeah. from the Commission. Uh, can't wait to see them um, about all different types of subjects. So will notified body accept it if it makes common sense and if it's supported by uh, by actual uh, experiences and actual data, uh, uh, maybe not clinical data but performance data, and you are able to build a good clinical evaluation story out of it. I and use this me mechanism, I think, definitely. Uh, maybe we should discuss this also with the, uh, the ISO committees. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, well, how can we, how can we some create something or, here? Or, yeah. or no, I'd, I, preferably I'd like to first have it you know, somewhere in, in uh, guidance documents and yeah. maybe later on when we have more experience with it because there is no experience with this concept. Okay, you got, I, it, I it's can. just about, it's just a, how do you say that nicely, a very nice balloon that we uh, bring up exactly. and hopefully nobody will shoot it down. Exactly. Uh, exactly. Or and if you shoot it down, bring up another balloon. I, don't, I really don't care, but we got to think out of the box a little bit here. Okay. So good. So yeah. thank you, Robert, for a very nice talk, yeah. and uh, thank you also for all the presentation that you had made. No problem. Qualimetrics is an analytical CRO. Uh, now in the light of the new medical devices uh, regulation, uh, the safety, the biocompatibility of materials is uh, a critical aspect that needs to be properly addressed. Uh, so uh, in this frame, the second pillar focuses on the uh, biological safety evaluation according to the provisions of the recently updated ISO 10993 part one. So in this frame we can provide uh, biological risk assessment, but most importantly we can perform the chemical characterization uh, and this is achieved by state-of-the-art instrumentation and analytical expertise that are both available at our lab. Top of 2019 doubling symposium has been unbelievably beneficial. The human medicines aspect, the medical devices split into MDR, IVDR, as well as the vet med, which is, uh, has been extremely useful. The SME parallel sessions, talking to panelists, talking to industry professionals, meeting lots and lots of people from my past. Um, it's been really, really good. We've had live music, we've had lots of food, we've had expeditions outside, team building. It's been a really, really nice experience, certainly for us. Thank you very much, Topper. Okay, it's been a really um, useful, forward-looking conference, and it's concentrated on the future rather than all the problems and issues that we've currently got at the moment. And it's been really nice to be looking five years ahead 
rather than, than you know, next week or tomorrow what guidelines are coming out. The other thing that's been really lovely is having a, a 50-50 mix of medical device and pharma people. And the pharma people have learned from the medical device people and the medical device people have learned from the pharma people. And it's really nice to get that mixture because quite often they don't get together together to, to talk about these sorts of things. Um, Organisationally, fantastic conference. Very easy to talk to the regulators. Nice relaxing opportunity to talk to the HPRA, the Serbian regulators, Saudi FDA and so on. So, uh, no, uh, we're looking forward to the next one. So, it's the final day of the symposium. Three excellent days. Uh, phenomenal discussions, phenomenal passion, phenomenal information sharing. Uh, just an all-round excellent conference. We've had very good feedback from all our delegates. Uh, standholders have enjoyed it and got some really first-class uh, contacts and opportunities. And I think that the, the thing that struck me more than most uh, here was the, the level of networking that was done uh, and the intensity and the knowledge that our delegates have. So a wonderful conference and the staff at the Clayton were absolutely brilliant. So we're really happy because we've got lots of happy delegates uh, and that's what Topra does best. So um, great session, um, great stands, um, really good um, networking events and um, overall um, I'd say this symposium was a great hit for Topra and I think a lot of our um, um, delegates really enjoyed it. So see you all um, at Jump 2020. So here we are at the end of our three days in Dublin. We've had a wonderful time. Over 630 people have gathered together to share information, make new contacts. We've had people from around the world, from as far afield as Australia and Korea and of course across Europe. And we hope they'll all come together again in Brussels in 2020.